Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here to speak to you uh, and for the very detailed introduction. <laughs> it's been nice, actually. You reminded me that in a different life I was a faculty in the Center for Complex Systems and Brain Sciences uh, in the mid 90s in Florida. Not too different from what you have envisioned here as a vision. So it was a wonderful time. Ten years I was there. Yep. So I will, whenever I have a black slide, can you turn it off? And then, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I will give you an overview of the type of work that we do. And having had so many discussions about uh, Europe here also over the last two days, I decided to put in a few slides of, uh, on the Human Brain Project, because I'm not sure to what degree you know about that. And it is actually something that occupies uh, our minds uh, quite a lot today. Yeah? And so I, I wanted to tell you a little bit of uh, what is happening. And there is a, a secondary motivation that you will see on uh, one of the <coughs> next few slides. So uh, at the moment, uh, the, um, the organization of neuroscience seems to, to change. At least we, have, we are investigating of, uh, other ways of how to do neuroscience uh, together, definitely in Europe. Um, uh, large-scale brain initiatives start coming up. That is a human brain project, one of the flagships. And la later on, uh, just a few years later, the brain initiative came up uh, in the US. There is, uh, in China, the brain project. They have a cognitive uh, neuroscience project in Australia. There is a, a, a project mostly uh, based on the marmoset uh, in Japan. So. Uh, in physics, we have known this type of cooperation 
in large scale projects before in neuroscience, it's a novelty. Yeah? And uh, there are attempts to see if that works. And uh, the Human Brain Project has been put in place in 2023. There was a big call, one of the flagship calls. Um, and two projects have finally selected. That is the Human Brain Project, and the other one is the Graphene Project, uh, over 10 years. And that is essentially the idea. We put lots of money onto a consortium of people and fund them for 10 years. Yeah? Uh, so they can actually think on a larger scale. We are being evaluated every two years instead, and then we need to make arrangements if the evaluations are not so good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, but, but the idea is that you can put, uh, try to put a vision in place over uh, a longer time period, and we have to see if that works. 116 partner institutions from all over uh, Europe um, with associated partners uh, from all over the world. And uh, the idea essentially uh, was and still is the following that uh, the, we wish to understand brain function as emergent from uh, the uh, brain network organization of the brain. So understanding is one key feature with translation into clinical applications and into technological applications. And uh, at the moment, this shall be supported by the building of a European infrastructure, completely federated and distributed over European countries, where the supercomputing and informatics requirements that are needed are being put into place under uh, one common entry point. And uh, this is where we are at the moment. I remind you that this project is a FED project, Future Emerging Technologies. Yeah? So in the beginning, 2013, there was a ramp up phase and then the funding periods uh, with appropriate evaluations. We are roughly here, yeah? right in the middle and end of March, 2020, the large three year period in this case will uh, uh, start, finish end of 2000, no, middle 2023 and one of the reasons why I uh, mention it here is the European Commission wants us to make it permanent, like a permanent European infrastructure that serves uh, the European and the world community for uh, performing computations, yeah? the data curation, data organization, uh, simulations across different scales of organization. Um, over la uh, large timescales, like CERN is an infrastructure that is being maintained by Europe. The idea is that the same thing shall happen here. And uh, the elements that are in there is experimental research is being done mostly on the rodent and in the human, but with a focus always on the human across different scales from the molecular level through the subcellular level, building individual neurons in silico, building neural masses, they're called, yeah? so organizations of populations of neurons, taking human brain imaging into account and uh, uh, mapping it upon computational infrastructures on which this type of simulation can be performed. Yeah? With going all the way with regards to societal influences, there is a neuroethics components in the Human Brain Project also with the idea that all this will be validated against uh, rodent data, but m with a major focus on uh, human data. Yeah? And I'm focusing primarily on human data and want to show you a few things of how this is being done. In terms of organization, it has been organized into 12 sub-projects, but uh, uh, theoreticians working together, trying to put the mathematical multi-scale tools together uh, in order to get a coherent uh, theory of at least brain activation patterns. Yeah? Um, data uh, stored in medical informatics platforms, organized and curated with the appropriate software through the neuroinformatics. SP is always sub-project. Yeah? Large-scale simulations performed on five uh, of the supercomputers distributed in Europe, connected through the infrastructure is what we're working on, and equipped with an analytics and computing platform that allows to access these high performance computing resources, access the storage, access the data. Imagine human data is very difficult to access, if, especially if there are data protection for patient data. How do you share this? How do you make it accessible? These are 
uh, non-trivialities that are far beyond uh, just the curation and with applications into neural robotics. So uh, there are reconstructions of the brain. The brain atlases uh, are one big topic on the rodent level. Yeah, they are uh, <coughs> being anchored. All the data being anchored in the same reference uh, frame that allow access of the data. In the, uh, represented in a three-dimensional physical space and uh, then can be features can be extracted you can perform queries on the atlas extract data and then put it into your uh, brain model the same what is happening right now over the next few years is we are want to do with the human brain um, uh, with the human brain in the brain reference framework. And here you have uh, just one example, one of the videos that gives you an idea of the reconstruction of uh, the brain in 3D. It's multi-scale using a technique which is called PLI, polarized light imaging, um, allowing to zoom on the individual fibers. Yeah? Here you see a slice. This is from a post-mortem uh, reconstruction of uh, the brain slice, individual areas, and uh, the colors are encoding actually the directionality of the individual fibers. This organized in 3D provides your template with, which allows us to work and equip it essentially with uh, mathematical models. For this, especially when you do multi-scale simulations, about which I will talk, you need the access to the appropriate infrastructure that is being provided by the virtual brain. This is led in particular by the Ulich team, uh, where one of the supercomputers is uh, available. Another thing that is being pushed is also novel technologies for the future. We call this neuromorphic uh, um, computation, essentially not only relying on binary computation, but also on analog computations. And there are two types of architectures that we use. One is the brain scales in Heidelberg, and the other one is a spinnaker. So this is a brain scales chip. This is a spinnaker uh, architecture. They allow to map integrated fire neuron mathematics, which is essentially a circuit form. It's like an LC circuit, yeah, with a composed of induction and capacitance and resistance, translated into ordinary differential equations that you then implement on the hardware. Yeah? So it's an analog circuits. And especially the brain scales waiver, it's referred to allows certain forms of computation like local learning, active dendrites, to a factor 10,000 faster than in real time. Yeah? So this is something we cannot even simulate on uh, uh, classical computers that we use nowadays. That allows to address questions in development, in uh, aging, across the lifespan, and even evolution. Yeah? So uh, these are things that are possible now here just a quick video that is coming out of a simulation out of Idan Segev's uh, lab as the hippocampus reconstructed out of uh, neurons where the and this is what you see here beautifully you take a single neuron yeah and you reconstruct it with thousand compartments the dendrites the morphology so very very detailed so each neuron is multi thousand dimensional and represented in three-dimensional physical space, equipped with the appropriate uh, uh, differential equations. And uh, then you can perform the type of this type of simulations. It's important because the dendrites are connecting with each other. Axons are coming in, making synaptic contact, uh, uh, contacts. And this is a question of the geometry, essentially, the, uh, the density of the synapses. So you need this type in order to be able to uh, representation, in order to scale it up. The same for different parameter setting, yeah? same system. And then what you see here is essentially the type of uh, spatial-temporal pattern formation we know from other systems like traveling waves that we can <coughs> systematically study in this type of uh, representations. Yeah? So this is possible today. Yeah? And uh, what we are focusing on in the Human Brain Project, especially also coming from my group and some of the colleagues, what I just showed you is the type of simulations that are being performed in the uh, software package Neuron or Arbor, where you have a neuron represented, the Zitsoma, it's detailed morphological representations, so that would have 1,000 degrees of freedom. But mathematically, we are mapping it on what we call point neurons, so much of these properties are linear cable theory. So you can actually represent it through a Green's function. 
so integral formulation, and map it upon so-called brain uh, point neurons that you then can assemble within a network in a confined neuron in a confined neuronal uh, volume that you can either simulate and there appropriate software is an asked or you can apply mean field theories uh, that we uh, there are different approaches but it's classical statistical physics in order to obtain even reduced descriptions with which we can then equip individual brain regions and this is a large scale network level this is one of the contributions we have made over the years yeah so uh, in this particular domain here where we can build individual circuits and much of what we would refer to as function yeah um, individual functions that are being attributed to them, uh, micro circuits can be studied on this level yeah when you go higher up to a certain behaviorist function in the human we have to go uh, to the network uh, level or in particular misbehavior such as epilepsy what i will talk about this is also our access point that we, our level of access in the human. In the human, very rarely we have access to uh, imaging the type of activity on this level of organization. Yeah? So here, this is a transfer function I referred to when we map upon point neurons. Some relevant publications, this is coming from Henry Markram's group. And when we want to link human behavior upon the network activations, this is one uh, review paper coming out of my group. So this would be relevant publications in this context. So we will focus today mostly on this aspect. Here, yeah? um, and how we do that is essentially we take a three-dimensional representation of uh, the brain. Yeah? What we perform is uh, we, we perform a parcellation into individual brain regions yeah? that we connect to its brain connectivity that we can also extract non-invasively in the human. This is actually possible with MRI techniques. So we have connectivity, individual connecting fibers. You will see better images in a moment. And we can take micro-organization, the microstructure in individual areas. Here you see the granular density of the neurons. Here you see some fiber pathways. So we do that, we put this together, and when we measure directly in the human brain, there is a large diversity actually of measurements that we need to take account that we want to map from this diversity we have in these individual regions uh, through the network action upon what can be measured directly in the individual brain region. So that is a little bit the outline and what I want to guide you through is some of the concepts that we're dealing with. Yeah? So, this is what I just spoke about, the microscopic organization or cells that would be what we call the point neuron once the morphology is being mapped upon this. And here you see a representation in terms of circuit diagrams. This is essentially the mathematics that we use. Yeah. Nonlinear ordinary differential equations, the so-called Hodgkin-Huxley equations. Yeah. Mapped upon reduced uh, micro circuits, mesoscopic populations, and then through the statistical mechanics going up uh, we are reducing it to one single point here. Yeah? And uh, essentially, uh, this is what it looks like. Brain uh, resolution, when we are looking, once we are looking at this individual point, uh, it has multiple square millimeters, multiple square centimeters, depending on the resolution that we work with. We work typically with 200 to 400 regions or 200,000 regions. When we have 200,000 regions, oh, actually, let's say 50,000 regions, then we have a resolution of two, uh, two, three millimeters. Like this, it is a few uh, centimeters. And what we are putting in here is essentially, we are cutting it into pieces, and then we go through the process that I just described. We take some of the cellular details into account in the individual region, reconstruct it, and then uh, separate it into inhibitory and excitatory neurons and then we perform the mean field theory. That gives us a very reduced description of what we call a neural mass. Yeah? And then from non-invasive brain imaging we can reconstruct what, what is today called the connectome in three-dimensional physical space and we uh, put these two things together and this is our entry point. Connect co-register the parcellation of this network with the connectome 
and have a skeleton in three-dimensional physical space. Yeah? And uh, this uh, we do for various applications of which I will show you one at the end of this presentation. Yeah? First of all, some reality check. It's a data, human data, an electrode inserted into a human brain. This is a, a micro and macro electrode. So micro means has a very small tip in there in which you can measure individual action potentials. These are discharges of individual humans. Yeah? This is an epileptic patient. When you then measure simultaneously the uh, local field potential, uh, this is what you observe here. Yeah, so with uh, that, you measure the potential electric potential in the neighborhood of uh, uh, this uh, population. Here you have one single neuron. This is a population. And when you take the density of this, with, uh, you com can compute here the density. And here you can compute an envelope function of this. And you can uh, overlay it. You see that it's quite well correlated. And what we want to obtain with the, our mean field approaches is essentially this type of activity representing the overall changes of the density of the discharges, identifying this as a variable of communication in the information transfer between individual network nodes. This is our approach. Here you see an example coming out of the simulations from Atlantis Dex. Excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, these are model neurons and uh, applying uh, approaches from statistical physics, calculating the uh, two cumulants, yeah? the mean field and the variation, and uh, then evolving over time. Here's the stimulus coming in. The smooth curve is coming out of the modeling, and the uh, zigzaggy curve is the one coming directly from simulation. So that works fairly well. You see another simulation coming out of my lab. This is being, uh, coming from Damian Battaglia in my lab where you do the same, but now this time in a distributed network. Again, representation of individual neurons. You see there are patterns in there. Yeah? Again, when you compare it to the uh, density, you can see some variations of the density. And that then can be co uh, connected to the local field potential, which is the potential in outside that you would measure here. And you can actually demonstrate that when you link this to mean fields, you obtain the same time uh, low dimensional mean fields that have only two degrees of freedom. You obtain the same type of representation on the network level as proof of concept that uh, you would get uh, from the detailed simulation. This is nicely represented here, actually. Uh, just showing you an architecture with a large scale fiber and uh, nearest neighbor connections as proof of concept. Uh, you can implement this through different uh, um, representations, a very, very high dimensional representation with 40,000 neurons, which is the most realistic one that we work with. You have so-called uh, adaptive exponential integrate and fire neurons that is being simulated through NEST using this architecture. But you can also use the mean fields that I spoke about or simplified neurons, also uh, multiple 10,000 of simplified neurons. And when you perform a parameter sweep in the appropriate regions, here this is a time delay of our propagation through this particular fiber. And here this is one uh, parameter that is being varied, one or a single neuronal parameter. You see that on all three levels, when you plot the synchronization of the neuronal population between area one and area two, you can represent the uh, uh, wavy patterns and the organization in the parameter space. The difference is this here is high dimensional. It requires a high performance cluster for simulation. And this representation you can run here on my laptop within a few minutes yeah, for the interior parameter sweep. So that makes a key difference. And what we want to extract for us, it's important to have the, topolo the topology and the organization in the parameter space matching what is happening in the detailed system, but operating on this particular level in order to go to full brain representations to ask uh, more detailed questions about the human fully connected brain. Yeah, because what we want to extract are not the questions on the microcircuit level, as I showed you earlier. We are willing to pay the price and lose quite some of the biology, the physiological, biological detail, 
by going on to the level of the neural mass, but being able to operate networks of this form or more complicated networks. Yeah? This is our key motivation. So if you ask me biologically detailed molecular questions at the end of this talk, there is something I miscommunicated. Yeah? You have to ask me network questions because this is a level on which we want to operate. Yeah? So we are building networks that are informed uh, by the human brain and ask network questions. At the moment, admittedly, we ask mostly energy dissipation question through the network. So we are addressing the physical properties of the network. There are also other more detailed neuroscientific questions, such as attention. How does attention work? How does working memory work? Yeah. It has to be supported by the physical substrate. Yeah. But at least from my group, we are focused at the moment on the physical properties of the network in order to exploit this for clinical and technical applications. Yeah. Uh, you, you see the distinction. Uh, this is a workflow that we are putting in place. Yeah? We take a human being, we scan the human being in the uh, MRI and reconstruct the cortical surface and the subcortical surface and uh, a patient-specific connector. Co-registered in the same space, it gives us a three-dimensional representation in terms of network nodes and the links. And you see that this will be, of course, parcellation dependent. This is what I showed you earlier, uh, what I said earlier. Here you see different visualizations of uh, the previous statement. So we have a few hundred parcels yeah, versus a few thousand parcels with a resolution on the millimeter level. If we go below that, it doesn't make sense using mean field theory anymore because we enter into the domain where the microcircuitry becomes important. So we have to be respectful with regard to this. So we will not go beyond that. Um, then the mathematics that is behind that is the following. There is a dot on top of the C. Yeah. Yeah, th there should be a little more space. We deal typically with uh, a, a time delayed integral differential equation. Temporal derivative. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a vector field, typically between 1 to 12 dimensions, depending on what your mean field looks like that you put on a particular vector node. Yeah? Defined in uh, three-dimensional physical space, yeah? x time equals the intrinsic dynamics <coughs> that is here yeah? on each network node. Typically in nonlinear dynamics, um, of, yeah, as I said, 1 to 12 uh, degrees of freedom. Then you have local connectivity, which does not play a role in this representation, but here it does play a role. Yeah. Here it plays a role because here we have, uh, we, are, uh, we have fibers that leave the gray matter and other fibers that uh, do not leave the gray matter. They stay within the gray matter and they have typically a range of a few millimeters. Yeah. This is mathematically represented as a convolution function, x minus x prime, uh, two to three, four, five millimeters, something like that, yeah? Plus the fibers I showed you earlier that you can reconstruct from the white matter skeleton, yeah? Key difference here is this is translationally invariant in space, this is not, yeah? Both are nonlinear transfer functions that depend on the mean field representation that you have chosen. So it's agnostic with regard to this. X prime is information coming from somewhere else being projected over here. Here we ignore the time delay. Here we do not ignore the time delay because the distances here can be up to, up to 20 centimeter. If you go from occipital lobe, cross from one hemisphere to the other and you go to the frontal areas. Yeah? If uh, average propagation speeds are three to six meter per second, uh, let's make it one meter per second, or one millimeter per millisecond, if you have 10 centimeters, you end up with time delays of 100 milliseconds. Characteristic oscillations or time scales in the brain range from one hertz, again to make it simple, one hertz to 100 hertz. Yeah? So if you have 10 hertz, uh, this is 100 milliseconds here, the time delays matter. You cannot exclude them. And this is something that makes this representation here unique, in fact. Many of these 
systems that we look at, that we work with in physics, even though there are time delays present in there, they do not depend on the connectivity architecture, at least one that is spatially variant. When we perform our uh, mathematical analysis there of if you wanted to perform a, uh, a decomposition into modes or something like that, this here will give you uh, uh, constant time delays that depend on the connectivity across different modes. When you do this here, this part of the equation, you can actually mathematically translate into a partial differential equation because of the translationally invariant kernel. Yeah? You can decompose it, you can perform a, uh, a Taylor uh, uh, de uh, decomposition and go to, uh, to second or fourth order spatial differential <coughs> operators. Yeah? This is not the case here because of the time delay. So new techniques need to be dealt with in order to deal with this uh, mathematical complexity that is behind it. Yeah? So it's actually quite some fun. Stochastic integration with many time delays enters into the computer memory. Mathematically, uh, it makes a system infinite dimensional. Yeah? So you have to reduce it on the appropriate manifolds if the system is uh, low dimensional, if an attractive manifold exists in which the system works. So questions from biology, such as task paradigms, now have to be translated mathematically into what are the subspaces in this high dimensional brain space in which the dynamics evolves? How can we extract the manifolds, the trajectories? So this is a link between the mathematical representation on the one hand side in the biological cognitive neuroscience language, and it's highly non-trivial to do that. So this is, uh, these are the things that we are struggling with. Just uh, to, uh, uh, to give you struggling with in a sense on what are the right paradigms to pin the system, for instance. As a physicist, one would say, well, perturb it, break it, yeah, break it, yeah. Uh, so, but you can perturb it. So perturbation approaches are one of the approaches that we are pushing forward at uh, the moment. Yeah? And uh, just to give you an example of the relevance of the particular time delays, graph theory has become very popular in the human uh, brain, in the study of brain connectivity. And as you see uh, uh, in the graph theory, there are different type of measures that you can uh, uh, use such as clustering coefficient or in strength is for instance the number of incoming fibers weighted by the weight of that and it actually when you take the time delay into account yeah and um, uh, you can actually look at the synchronization patterns that are allowed between individual regions yeah and uh, that will depend on the strength, but also on the phasings between two areas that shall synchronize. Yeah? Because a time delay can shift an in-phase synchronization, synchronization into anti-phase. Yeah? So we can actually rescale the connectome and the graph theoretical measures as a function of the frequency and the time delay. Yeah? Uh, in class tomorrow, we will derive this, actually. Yeah? So, uh, and you, uh, here you see actually the scalings that are possible, and it can provide you with different uh, graph theoretical organizations here, this, the so-called dynamic core in the center, and identify which areas are important. So, changing the time delay or changing uh, the f operating frequency, you can actually change the synchronization patterns and information processing has to be looked at from the perspective of different frequency bands. This is a message here. And in the next slide, you can do this actually explicitly for the uh, full brain connectome, where you can equip every single node here with an oscillatory system. Here, uh, and then look uh, uh, for, as a function of the different frequencies, you can perform a simulation. And you can compute a cross-correlation function across all the brain areas against the other brain areas, this left hemisphere, right hemisphere, interhemispheric connections. And you see that as, a, uh, as you change the frequency, the different, uh, the functional connectivity is called the cross-correlation changes. Or if you look at the clusters of the phasings, you can look at the phase clustering index, which tells you how often a cycle occurs aligned with uh, another cycle uh, from one area to the other. 
you see that it changes as a function of the frequency. And uh, when you take those and collapse them upon a mean phase cluster representation, you see that depending on the discharge uh, function or behavior in each individual network node, the phasings can completely change, completely to the way that it can become completely dephased or synchronized or multimodally synchronized, which is very important because one of our understandings nowadays is that the synchronizations of oscillator frequencies in different rain regions is actually which is responsible for the emergence of our cognition of the percept. Yeah? So this here has here this has nothing to do with perception or cognition, but what it has something to do with is actually the uh, physical support of the capacity of different brain areas to get synchronized. This is what we see here. Yeah, that's what I wanted to have shared with you. Very briefly, <coughs> so we put this over the last few years, we put this together uh, in a uh, near informatics platform that is freely available under this website. It's now part of the Human Brain Project. And uh, essentially everything that I discussed today in terms of representations, including all the treatment of the brain images. If you manage to scan your brain with an MRI, which is not that unusual nowadays. You can essentially mimic and virtualize your own brain and perform the type of simulations that we're talking about here. You can build this type of images of your own brain, get it into the simulator, uh, treat your connectome, yeah, and uh, manipulate it, reorganize it, put in a lesion if you choose to do so, and then run the appropriate simulations, either on the source space or you can project it up on the sensor level to the EEG directly on the surface and mimic your own uh, EEG. Yeah. Or MEG or fMRI signal, which is nowadays uh, clinical uh, practice. So we have here uh, the capacity of uh, building personalized brain uh, models and uh, ask questions explicitly. We can do this also for the mouse. The mouse we use at the moment as uh, the key model for the validation. So essentially the same treatment of the type of data I presented you can be performed, of course, also completely for the mouse. Connectome, reconstruction of the surface. The mouse cortex is not folded. This is the way what it looks like, all the way time. Yeah. And uh, when you reconstruct the connectome, there are different types of tractographies. Uh, so you typically take a seed point and then you reconstruct the fibers. This is using one algorithm uh, called probabilistic tractography. This one is called deterministic tra uh, tractography because it uses a deterministic algorithm. So you have much fewer false positives but more false negatives in there in the reconstruction. The good thing in the mouse is you can test it against the gold standard, which means you can access databases that exist, in particular with our collaborator, Allen Institute in the US, and actually test the anatomical organization against real world fibers that you obtain, of course, invasively through trace injections and then reconstruct them in physical space. So this is not a bad sanity check. Uh, then uh, the, you know at least for sure for the connectome. You can perform the same mathematics in the representation of the uh, three-dimensional physical space and then perform the same steps as we do for the human. You take the mouse, put it in the scanner, perform tractography, you uh, reconstruct the connectome. So this is the individual mouse, this is connectome, the DDI data, and you build a virtual mouse. Yeah? And you can per uh, simulate the signals as we just said. Yeah? You can do the same thing also, but in the scanner you can also measure functional data, yeah? meaning uh, resting state paradigms, for instance, as we do for the human. Yeah? Then you obtain experimental bold signals. Bold refers to what is being measured in the functional MRI. It's a blood oxygenation that is being measured there. So you get this. And then you can compare simulated data against experimental data. This is a big field in itself. How do you perform uh, the validation against that? Yeah? So what I described earlier in terms of functional connectivity is one of the classic metrics that is being used for the comparison between model and data, so you can compare it, you can validate it, 
There are significantly better and more advanced approaches that we know from other fields of uh, outside of neuroscience that are only f entering right now, such as Monte Carlo approaches, uh, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo approaches, for instance, where you perform a high dimensional sampling of the data of the parameters in order to match it. Yeah, so this is where big data is coming in. But you can do the same thing also we're using real connectomes from the mouse, the, the one that is coming from the Allen Institute, and perform the same type of uh, steps, reconstruction. So they have a gold standard again, and you can com compare it against. And you can perform lesions in here and see what the changes are, etc. And when you do this, um, here I'm showing you one example for the resting state. Uh, this is a predictive power. Uh, and you can, for instance, what you can do is you can scan a mouse, perform the reconstruction, and then you scan the same mouse again, forget the modeling. Just a scan, rescan variability gives you this value, it's about 60%. Scan, rescan variability with regard to this particular matrix. One of many, but it's a, a very representative. So we cannot expect to ever get our 90%, but this is the best we can get. Yeah, if we uh, use the same mouse again. From the models, uh, we get, uh, for instance, uh, when we use a reconstruction based on the Allen Institute, use the original one coming directly from uh, the tracer data, we get our, up to almost 50% reconstruction. If we use the individualized connectome of the mouse, so this is the type of question we can use, yeah? we are here at 43%, yeah? In the, under, uh, 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 good conditions, and uh, when we use an average connectome or surrogates or an, uh, uh, another type of connectome that is not the mouse own connectome, it goes down to 35%. Yeah? So this is already some proof of concept, and this we see over and over again, that using the individual connectome of a human being or of a mouse for the reconstruction for the modeling is already informative with predictive so um, this to tell you the direction when we talk about personalized medicine in this particular context from computational medicine, this is one of the directions where this is going. And in the remaining minutes, I want to show you how we can do this now actually systematically, systematically to, for the human being, yeah? because the same steps we can do now for the human being, and I'd like to do this for the case of epilepsy. Yeah? Just to position you, uh, epilepsy is a disorder uh, that is very common. It's actually the most common disorder in a neurological disorder where 1% of the population suffers from that. Yeah? And uh, two things that are noteworthy, multiple things are noteworthy, but uh, first, 60%, uh, 60, 65% 60, of the 1% that suffer from this can be pharmaceutically treated, the others cannot. Yeah? So uh, for those, the only possibility of relief from their suffering is surgery. Yeah? And it's the most common and best intervention at the moment. In order to obtain an insight of what is happening uh, in the brain, you want to form a resection, you better know what to resect. Yeah? So, uh, we are performing invasive recordings. We implant electrodes that are about that length with 10 points on it, spaced of multiple millimeters. You see this here, so two millimeters <laughs> distance. So these are so-called macro electrodes of the types of measurements that I showed you earlier from the human. Yeah. They're being inserted here. Typically, it varies between eight to 20 times 10 electrodes. So you have up to 200, 300 points distributed in physical space. This is what it looks like. That goes back to Jean Bancon, uh, uh, Jean Toilerac in Paris in the 70s, actually. This is what the signals look like, in particular for seizure, when you have a seizure onset. Yeah? This is what a seizure looks like. Surgery success rate. And this was the target that we determined for us. Uh, here I'm plotting only 20 years, 30 years. But it goes back, actually, 50 years. Across all different types of epilepsies, if you average, the surgery success rate has been more or less constant. It has become less invasive. But the surgery success rate is 
I would have said 60%, but generally it depends uh, on uh, where you operate between 50 to 60% and has not improved. So even the smallest improvement, and this is what we're aiming for, by just 5%, given the uh, um, omnipresence of uh, epilepsy would be a success. And this is what we want to go for with the type of approaches that we do. Yeah? And what we do is the following, we build a, a, a virtual brain and what we need to have to be able to understand this, we need a, a good uh, data feature yeah, that can be identified that we want to have explanatory uh, power for. And I told you all about the networks. So epilepsy in this case is actually good for us because seizure propagation occurs through the network. And this can be informative about what is happening in the network. Number one, this is what we're exploiting. Number two, what the epileptologists look for is the epileptogenic zone as a target for resection. But the propagation occurs into other areas also, but these are completely healthy areas. So you don't want to perform a resection of the entire area, just of the small area, where to uh, resect. This is one thing. And then, of course, the key here is once we identify this, we can actually translate it into therapy, which is rare, because what do you do with Alzheimer's? Yeah? But here, once you have this, you can actually make it, uh, link it to an intervention. Yeah? And in this case, it's a resection of the identified area. And this pr the protocol that we put in place, non-invasive in imaging, reconstruction of a brain avatar, an avatar is a geometric form that we build as a network. We equip it with our mathematical models. We refine it through additional information that we have here. In this case, you have, for instance, uh, um, uh, uh, lesions in the MRI. And then we perform some data fitting that gets us all the way to surgery. We personalize the brain through uh, the data fitting and machine learning approaches. So we perform model inversion and we translate it into the clinics. And just to give you an uh, intuition, what we are essentially doing is we stimulate somewhere or oh, a seizure and it propagates. And if it's completely symmetric, the system, you have circular waves that are propagating. But if you personalize it, yeah, like in this case, you could put an uh, a, a, a oil in here, yeah, then the actual propagation would be deformed. And we are trying to extract the deformations that are in the system that we map upon manifolds in the high dimensional parameter space that are informative for us to get a feeling for where these uh, deformations, how they represent themselves in the network. This is the approach that we take. I'll give you, this is one patient for instance. I'll illustrate that along one patient. We reconstruct her using the tools we just talked about. These are the images from her. This is a weight matrix that we can extract from the tractography. These are the tracked lengths that give us the time delays, which are important for the synchronization behavior. And we can use also additional lesions that can be informative for the local connectivity. So when we do this, we go through this procedure I showed you. And we have then uh, the uh, resources represented all in three-dimensional space. <coughs> One thing I did not uh, refer to yet, one is uh, the big advantage of this approach is we can do is the red dots represent the vertices. We can stick in now our electrodes at places where the surgeon puts them in, but also wherever we want. Yeah? So it's a virtual approach. It's an in silico platform. This is what we can do. The, the missing electrode problem is one of the big problems in uh, the surgery uh, because they uh, never know if they miss a particular type of information. And then we uh, look for, uh, for the epileptogenic network as we fit it <coughs> against the data. Here an example, this is coming from the simulations. Seizure onset starts here on the right-hand side. And what I'm doing, in fact, is the energy that is in these time series, so these time series as they are measured by the electrodes here. Yeah? What I'm doing is in this rectangle, I'm scaling, I'm uh, integrating the energy that is in there, and I'm scaling up the size of the balls, the diameter of the balls, in order to de uh, identify where we are. And what you saw here is the seizure started on the right-hand side and propagated on the left hemisphere, this is a simulation, through the virtual brain of this patient 
that we just uh, looked at. Yeah. So again, now measured here, you see it's coming up on the right hand side, propagating through the thalamus. Yeah. On the left hand side, recruiting the temporal lobe, going up here, recruiting the temporal lobe. This is the temporal lobe starting with the discharge here, and then in these areas here on the right-hand side. This is roughly what a seizure looks like. Yeah? So you have a characteristic spatial temporal pattern. And the pa uh, this here is the real uh, patient's data, in fact. On the right-hand side, when you stimulate, you can either trigger a seizure, but here you have a spontaneous seizure. It stays on the right-hand side, so this patient data now, not simulation, can zoom in Initial artifact, fast discharges, emergence of a spike wave complex, and stop. And uh, the type of seizure I just showed you coming from the simulation, starting on the right-hand side, and then propagating on the left-hand side, and performing discharges on the temporal lobe and in the parahippo left para uh, uh, hippocampal area. Yeah? So this is a type of pattern that we uh, see and that need to be analyzed. And what we do, technically speaking, is we take this type of data. We select a subset of electrodes that you see represented here. Yeah, This is the same data. And then we compute the envelope functions yeah, across the electrodes, the envelope functions, and make this a data feature that we use for the confrontation with the model and using the machine learning algorithm in order to set the parameters. And what we use is essentially Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Just to give you a feeling for what it looks like, this is a rest state math mathematically, and then the system goes into a discharge. This is what it mathematically looks like, and the offset. So this is the mathematical object that we attempt to fit from the data, coming directly from the data, from the envelope functions. And if they don't seize, uh, then the fitting should be mostly here, as you see here, in this area. And if an area goes through a seizure, then this is what it looks like. These are the experimental data being sampled by the Monte Carlo sampler for the individual areas in there. Please do not forget, we have measurements on the SEG level, the EG level, but we are trying to infer the parameters on the source level. So there is also imp uh, implicitly the jump from the, the sensor to the source level. And this gives us the estimates for the epileptogenic zone in the patient. This is what you see here. Estimates for the epileptogenic zone in the patient expressed in terms of parameters. So this is what we give actually nowadays to the clinician. Yeah. Let me tell you what we do with the clinician. Uh, so I'm coming to the last few slides. First of all, uh, proof of concept. When we do what, we, what I just described to you, uh, this is done across 50 patients. When I, we do it with the patient's own connectome, this is our predictive power. When we do it with an uh, a, a average connectome, it jumps down or it uh, reduces. And we, uh, when we do a, a surrogate connectome, or then, uh, when we uh, destroy the topology of the connectivity, it goes down to zero, the predictive power. So again, proof of concept for patient uh, personalized driven uh, medicine. When we look in this example, when we, we perform a quantitative analysis of the, what the epileptogenic zone is in white, in red the propagation zone, and in green the areas, the difference areas between what came from the virtual brain prediction and what the clinician has actually executed yeah, through the surgery. So the size of the green area is either, so the green area is either a supplementary area or missing area. If you quantify the size per patient, gives you a, a, a detector of the degree of uh, um, the degree of goodness of prediction uh, coming from the virtual brain. And this is what you see here, actually. Yeah, there is a significant difference between what is uh, when there is a big discrepancy between what the surgeons did and uh, what is coming from the virtual brain. Typically, the seizure, uh, sur sorry, the surgery, typically, statistics, retrospective, is becoming uh, a, a fader. And if it's, it's correlated with a reduction in the discrepancy when 
uh, there is a success for that. And that is noteworthy because of what I told you here with regard to this, that it has not changed over the last few years. And that's the reason why we are just starting in June a clinical trial with 400 patients where they are undergoing the surgery actually following what is coming out of the virtual brain yeah? uh, um, and predicting the, the outcome. And this is uh, happening in 11 centers, now actually 13 centers in France where the data are being collected, centralized in Lyon, sent to us. We perform the virtualization. We make the clinical report as I just explained it to you and we send it back to the centers and that enters into the clinical decision making hopefully with the promise of improving the surgery. We need 400 in order to have the statistics uh, to be able to make a statement whether it will work or not. Yeah? What's happening now? Now, this is the outlook for the next three, four years. We are using this type of personalized virtual brain modeling as in order to reduce inv uh, invasive surgery. This is what you see here, for instance, a patient that was operated. Yeah? This is typically what it looks like. Uh, it can be fairly extensive. Uh, in the in silico model, very often the situation is such that we can, this is a symptomatic seizure where the patient shows uh, symptoms, is being bothered by the seizure. Yeah? You can but there are, if you can stop the propagation, which you have here in this particular case, is, uh, you observe actually a so-called asymptomatic seizure. The patient still seizes, but it doesn't show the symptoms on the behavioral level. Yeah. So one of the ideas is to stop the seizure from propagating. Uh, rather than making a, such a big uh, resection, the idea is to make interventions in the network it's a non-linear high-dimensional system in order to stop the seizure from uh, 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 propagating. And here, this is the first patient coming from uh, Gon uh, Gonzalez Martinez in Cleveland Clinic, where he made two interventions, one here and the other one there, uh, uh, in collaboration with us, yeah, with a laser. You have these drill holes in the head, and you pull out the electrode, and you put a laser tube in there, and then it burns out two to three millimeters. Yeah? of the tissue, yeah? And there you have, uh, so very minimal resections as opposed to something like that, yeah? And the patients have walked away, this patient has walked away seizure-free. This is in the beginnings, yeah? This is where we want to go. So it's network control theory from this perspective trying to control this. Other areas where we are looking at with our co uh, colleagues is with the Allen Institute, treatment discovery, but this time, not just mean field, but going down to the uh, cellular level where we can make some statements about the uh, cellular organization and potential entry for drugs. And this is already used by some of my colleagues. Uh, this is some work of Petra Ritter, for instance, addressing Alzheimer reorganization. There, it works more like a biomarker that we can use the virtual brain. And here, this is another example from uh, how a tumor in the brain can change the dynamics. Again, it can make statements about, uh, in this case, uh, outcome about therapy uh, based on the organization of the activity. So again, it serves as a biomarker. Yeah. So I want to share this with you to see the directions where we can go. Um, this is a summary of what I just told you. Yeah. So let's stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. This morning. Questions or comments? Please. Yes, I don't understand how do you have into account the, the topology of the network in your uh, field theoretical, in your field theory? What, which part did you not understand? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I don't understand, like for example you said that it is like a multidimensional uh, field. A what? A? M multidimensional yes. field. And what is the dimensionality? Like the mean degree of the network or? I did not, uh, no, not the network. Uh, I said that the mean fields with, uh, with which I equip the network node, uh, do I have a good network node? I equip each network node with a mathematical system. Yeah? Okay. This one is multi-scale. It can have multiple variables. Okay. Yeah? 
and these variables depend on the, and I deliberately did not make a statement because it's agnostic, the approach is agnostic to that. It depends on how you derive the mean field. Yeah? Okay. And there are different ways of doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, one way w which we do it in HPP is we keep it multidimensional. Uh, so it's not multidimensional, uh, high dimensional. Yeah? So uh, individual neurons. But then you have about 100,000 degrees of freedom in there. When we use mean field theory, yeah, we can collapse it upon a few collective variables. There it's typical. Uh, if we use the mean fields of uh, Destex, it's uh, statistical physics. You compute the first few moments and project them, perform averaging theory of the variables. You know, let me start again. You have to assume a neuron model, yeah, yeah which has typically two to three, four degrees of freedom, yeah? Mm -hmm. Times 10,000 or N of them, yeah? Then you perform averaging theory in order to uh, compute the, uh, the mean firing rate, for instance, and as a second momentum, the variation of the mean firing rate, because you need at least two mean field variables. This is standard in statistical physics. Yeah? Here, apply to your neuronal theory that gives you, would give you a two-dimensional, two-dimensional in terms of degrees of freedom, mean field here. Okay. The network topology does not enter in here. This okay. was a pure network node discussion. Okay. Now you connect it through the connector, mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, uh, represent it in three-dimensional space. So there are multiple steps in there. I did not really, you saw how long I spoke, yeah? So I did not talk about the mean field uh, approaches, actually. There are various of them, yeah? yeah? But they're, they're, the one that we use most is actually very classic. Okay, but in your mean field approach, you didn't have into account like uh, stochastic effects? Yes, we do take them into okay. account. You, the mean field approach you can do f uh, either fully deterministic. No, it's, it is a stochastic approach because uh, you have to have a noise term in there. And what we typically use is linear additive Gaussian white noise. Yeah, so linear additive mm -hmm. is in particular important. Okay. Yeah? And then we uh, perform the calculus that is associated. Okay. Stratonovich we use in particular. Mm -hmm. okay. Very impressive talk. Um, I understood that you said that uh, perturbative analysis, so uh, applying perturbations in the network, is one way of identifying the properties in the network. Yes. And, and confronted with experiments. And confronted with experiments. That's exactly my, my this is what we hope. Yeah. So, how reliable, how reproducible are the responses to such perturbations, and how does this depend on the size of the perturbation? Also comparing experiments and models. Okay. Um, perturbations we are approaching at the moment because of the uh, technique of validation that we have chosen to use. Mo uh, and this is highly non-trivial because in a frequentist approach you can always compute a cross-correlation, always perform an optimization, and it may be completely meaningless yeah? because the model uh, the models are not identifiable, especially in such a high uh, dimensional parameter space. We have, uh, that's the reason why, in my opinion, I start preaching more and more that we use, have to use Markov chain, Monte Carlo approaches in order to do a correct uh, sa uh, sampling of the manifolds <coughs> in order to be know quantitatively what we are talking about. Uh, that works uh, reasonably well for seizure propagation, as I showed you. We hope it will work for stimulations. Yeah? At the moment, we have only proof of concept that it works. Why do I hope that it works? It's a similar data feature. You stimulate with an onset, and you have propagation and dissipation of the energy through the network. If it's stronger connected, more energy will be dissipated. Yeah? See, I'm not talking about brain function at all. Yeah? Yeah, so, but with, uh, this data feature, we have demonstrated now uh, proof of concept that it's informative uh, for the network and we can extract some of the network parameters. To answer your question explicitly, I cannot tell you yet because we have not looked into experimental data yet. This is something that we are going to do. These electrodes that you have here, you can actually stimulate also, not only register, but you can stimulate these electrodes and then initiate this type of propagation patterns. You can also take a human being and use transcranial magnetic stimulation and stimulate directly from outside. These are the two approaches we will 
use, we do not have any results yet. Yeah? But uh, we need them in order to be able to parrot it outside of the field of epilepsy. Unless there are other data features that are equally informative, I, I am struggling with these things. I do not know. I mean, you have explained in detail what uh, this, this example of the epilepsy. Now you want to study, it's related to the question by you are now want to study another another uh, feature, for example, response to a visual stimulus or yeah. other kind of thing. What would you change? Because I assume the correct tone will be the same. So what do you have to change to reproduce the other features of the brain? We are not only having issues, we have to other things. Yes, that's the reason why I'm looking for other paradigms in order to in, uh, inform that, yeah? So, uh, uh, one possibility is, uh, w there are multiple possibilities. Stimulation, for instance, is becoming one of the uh, tools, uh, therapeutic tools in epilepsy or in pharmaceutically re uh, treatment resistant depression, yeah? Or in Parkinson, yeah? So, there, um, you're asking what type of intervention I would do because I don't have a resection here, right? Is that the question? No, the question is if you want to, to, <coughs> to study what happens in the brain in other, in nano, uh, not with epilepsy, but with other, uh, just looking at an image or, or just thinking on something or just having a Parkinson thing. Yeah. Like, so, so what do you change the in the modeling? In the modeling, the, the features we look at or that I want to look at are not represented here. This is what other people are doing. What I want to look at are, uh, in particular, uh, lesion in stroke. There we have already first examples. The network is also being uh, altered in stroke, and there is uh, rehabilitation. And the second feature I'm very interested in is in multiple sclerosis. What happens is, in multiple sclerosis, you have a demyelination of these fibers which increase the time delay because the myelin is the white, whiteness of the matter that accelerates the propagation speed by a factor of uh, 10. This degradation of myelin you can actually measure. You can measure uh, and you can image it uh, in images uh, uh, such as those here in MRI. So you have a mask of uh, the uh, distribution, a spatial pattern of distributions of uh, reductions of myelin and this provides me well, mathematically with a mask I can put into the model yeah, and can talk uh, and I can address now the uh, potential changes in the synchronization patterns yeah, of uh, the model. My problem will be only with stimulation. I can obtain signals probably only with the simulation, I can obtain signals sufficiently strong and informative enough as measured on the EEG, non-invasively, because for non-epilepsy patients, I don't have electrodes inside the head. So I have to rely on electrodes outside of the head, EEG, MEG, or in fMRI. So I will have to go most likely multimodally, putting these modalities together and be predictive about the effects I expect as I stimulate in the brain with multiple sclerosis. Yeah? These patterns you see, these lesion patterns in multiple sclerosis are informative for the clinician. They are using it in order to identify what the consequences are uh, for the patient in behavior because each patient has different symptoms because it depends on where the lesion pattern is. So we hope that we will be able to explain some of these effects. Yeah? So this is where I'm putting my, my bets on in the lab at the moment. Stimulation, I don't look at from the perspective of therapy because I don't know what stimulation does to the system. Actually, no one does. I'm looking at, uh, at it from the perspective of generating a data feature that is informative for me as a network model. Yeah? So. I imagine that the CCD phenomena yeah. um, an important role in, uh, for example, epilepsy, that a long-term uh, uh, situation, looking uh, longitudinal in depression. Is it possible to take in consideration this kind of uh, phenomena in this model? Um, plasticity in the sense of 
uh, development over the time scale of months or weeks. Yeah. yeah. So longitudinal uh, uh, follow up uh, on patients. Uh, this is we are not using plasticity in the model. The connectome, the connectivity is uh, stiff in the sense that it doesn't change. It's uh, time invariant. It, we could take it into account. There are models uh, and people that are, uh, work with plasticity, but uh, I'm at the moment hesitant in doing this because uh, we still need to develop a much better understanding of these networks and their relation to how they express themselves in the data. I'm hesitant to add in another form of complexity, another level, uh, another scale. Uh, there are some people that are discussing this, but I'm, I'm hesitant in doing this. I'm, yeah, because I, I doubt some of the results that are then being presented because of uh, the model identifiability that is behind. I do not understand exactly the assumption of uh, what you do in the sense that uh, you take data from a brain and then you build a network out of them, right? And for instance, in the case of epilepsy, uh, here what you do is that you assume a sort of um, standard brain that uh, does not have uh, epilepsy and has a, a sort of a regular network and you compare the data of this uh, of the of the patient to understanding the simulation where it, where the simulation is going wrong with, with respect to a, to a certain benchmark. But yeah, is this the, the point? Or yeah. I do not need nece uh, necessarily the standard brain. You could do it, but I don't need it because I start from zero, directly from the data of the patient. I do not need a standard brain against which I compare it. However. I could use a standard brain template and then perform the changes that come from the connectivity and the anatomical organization. And one thing that I said, but that's very quickly, here you have, a, for this particular patient that we looked at, uh, you have a hematoma in the hypothalamus, yeah, which is essentially a type of uh, abnormal cell cluster yeah, on the hypothalamus. And depending on where it is, it uh, causes, uh, it, can, it can cause seizures. Uh, I don't know how that expresses itself in the mathematical model. Okay. Yeah. Actually, no one does. I asked 10 clinicians, I got 10 different answers. Does it increase the excitability? Does it change the connectivity, etc.? So the good thing about an in silico approach is you can test it. You can Im uh, implement all, I didn't implement all 10 answers, but multiple of those. Yeah, such as what you see here as an example. This is a hypothalamus, now connected to its neighboring regions. So I altered its local connectivity. Yeah. So in this sense, I'm saying yes, I'm using some of the additional information on the standard, uh, on a template of the brain, but it's not a standard template, on, on the patient's brain. Yeah. And then I'm adding in the different type of information I have. Except of one, I have no idea about the organization of the epileptogenic zone. This I fit. Yeah? I take the model, the best model template I have, informed by additional features, and then I take, uh, this is my, then my, what I said earlier, avatar, yeah? so a geometric form. I equip it with mathematical equations, and then I uh, perform the fitting against the seizure data I have. Okay. That's the reason why the data features that I choose are very important. Okay. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah, uh, the, the, the last step is that how the, um, like how the information of the, of, like how the network information is uh, really useful for uh, clinicians in the sense that uh, they, if I understood correctly, they manage to identify the zone of the brain where something wrong is happening. In half of the cases, yes. and in the other half, they are failed in doing so. Yeah, yeah exactly. And you would help identifying this. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how is related the knowing how to be so very, uh, with a very gross coarse grain network of the brain, how uh, electricity spreading, 
how does this help clinicians to uh, identify this soon if you don't have a benchmark? Because I, I imagine that if you yeah. have a benchmark, then... Let, 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 let me stop here. Uh, this is our process. I'm not giving this information to the clinician. I'm giving, I'm explaining this to the clinician. This is our process. But all the clinician gets at the end, the clinician gets a clinical report from us. It does not get all the modeling steps. Yeah? The clinician gets only this one image, and I actually showed you the clinical report. The clinician gets this, nothing else. The clinician, by looking at the weekly time series I showed you uh, in the beginning, and looking at the history of the patient, and uh, looking, uh, having their experience, they uh, estimate where, in their opinion, is the epileptogenic zone. Okay, yeah? so it's just that uh, you and know that we are providing this where you observe some fluctuation. Of no, some not fluctuation. We are, we are, yeah. Our fitting target is the excitability, which is one parameter in the mean field model. Yeah, okay. this is our fitting target. Yeah, okay. and. This is what we provide the clinician with this year, this year, and this image has exactly the same type of information. And this is actually the images they are used to. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. See. And uh, here you have in color code actually the organization of the epileptogenic zone. It's here. It's the temporal lobe. Pre uh, 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 this is a, a, a prefrontal part of the lobe. Yeah this area here. So this is the information that we are providing them with and they call, uh, implement this information into their decision making. When a, a clinician, well they have once a week a staff meeting and discuss a patient. And there is always a clinician that is responsible for a patient. And they show EEG, uh, anatomical uh, aberrations, anomalies, medical treatment, uh, uh, other elements they have, and this clinical report. And then t take it into account, and then they make a decision about the surgery. This is how it is have done. Yeah. I have a short question. So, for the moment, all the notes are the same. How important will be the implementation in the notes of the network? Extremely important. Mm -hmm. So, do you know how to implement that or to take that into account? Work of the next three years in the Human Brain Project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, good. yes. Any other question or comment? Well, if not, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much.